Um, hi, my name is Marit van Dijk. I'm from the Netherlands, as you can tell from my last name, uh, probably. I'm here today to talk to you about use testing to develop better software faster. Um, it's based on an article that uh, I wrote for 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know, edited by Kevlin Henney and Trisha G. And I'm probably going to tell you a lot of things that you already know. But I hope that I can also give you some pointers of what you can improve. And I'm going to show you some examples of tests that I've encountered in the wild in, in code bases I've worked on uh, to show you why I'm still talking about testing, even though we know a lot of these things. Because some of the tests that I've seen out there make me feel like this, honestly. And that's if there even are any tests, because sometimes, have you ever opened a project and there's like source, main, Java, and no test directory? Anyone? Anyone else? Oh, that's too many hands. I'm so sorry. So, you know, when you write a feature, you finish write it, building the feature, it might have taken you longer than you had hoped, and you didn't write any tests yet. By the time I'm done with the feature, I'm usually also quite done with the feature, do you know what I mean? So then you have to add the tests on, and you try to get them done quickly, and if you add them on at the end, in my experience, you're more likely to be testing your implementation of the feature than the actual intended behavior of the feature. And you cannot test the quality in at the end. That's not how it works. You need to build the quality in as you're developing the feature. Um, and if, especially in DevOps, where we are continuously building things, deploying them to production, running them in production, and back, um, we don't test only at the end, uh, like we did in Waterfall. Um, this is a model from Dan Ashby. Uh, the link to the blog post is there. And I'll um, add the slides on Speaker Deck after, if you want them. Um, so you test continuously throughout the DevOps cycle. And there are different testing activities that you can do in each part of that cycle. Um, this is a model by uh, Janet Gregory and Lisa Crispin, who've written lots of books on agile testing. And they, uh, they list all of the different things that you can do during your DevOps cycle to help improve the quality. So in DevOps, we can be testing all the time because we want to get the right feedback at the right time to feel confident enough for whatever the next step is that we're taking, whether that's committing your code, pushing it, merging it, deploying it. We want to make sure um, to get the right feedback at the right time and to be confident enough. And what confident enough means might depend on your context. I used to work for uh, an online retail platform if we made a mistake and the system went down, the worst that could happen was people couldn't buy stuff, but nobody died. That might be different if you're working in medical equipment or self-driving cars. So make sure that you know that you're confident enough for whatever your context is. Um, and it starts with asking questions. Before you build the feature, think about, do I understand what it's supposed to do? Do I understand how it's supposed to work? Do I understand what it's not supposed to do? I've had a feature request where it's like, okay, if X happens, then the system should do Y. Okay, what if that doesn't happen? Does it do nothing? Does it do something else? Is there anything else that can happen? What could possibly go wrong? Um, and, and asking these questions beforehand will help you build a better solution for the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, there are formal ways of doing that. Uh, is anyone familiar with TDD or test-driven development? 
Do you use test-driven development? Hands go down or are a bit iffy. I, I, I agree, I don't use it as often as I should, as I know I should. Um, but I, st I still think that even if you don't use formal TDD or BDD um, uh, methodology, just thinking about what your test cases are will help you, even if you don't write your test first and then the code, etc. cetera. Um, but I do love TDD and I do highly recommend it. Uh, and I love it especially for bug fixing, because if you're trying to fix a bug, someone is nodding, thank you. Um, if you're fixing a bug, writing a test to reproduce that bug helps you make sure that you understand the bug and that you're reproducing it in the correct way. You'll have a failing test, you fix the bug, the test will pass, you know that your fix is correct, and because you have a test in place, you know that the bug will stay dead, which is also what we want. Um, so don't only, only think about what the feature should be doing, also consider what could possibly go wrong. Uh, did anybody attend Brian Vermeer's talk here yesterday? Um, okay, a few people. So he had the, the example of Equi Equifax uh, that ended up in the headlines for not patching their software. So one of the things to consider, and of course this again depends on your context, is if we release this feature, what's the worst headline that we could end up with? Um, another thing to consider is how can this software be abused? If I'm a stalker X, can I use this to track someone around the world or make their life a living hell? Don't build that. Um, I know a lot of testers who are really, really good at coming up with this, uh, this stuff. Uh, one of them is Elizabeth Zagroba. She lives in the Netherlands and writes blog posts and does talks, as, et cetera. Excuse me, she wrote this blog post have I tried enough weird stuff? And um, if you're, like, a, as a developer like me, if you're not as good at coming up with what could possibly go wrong, like most testers uh, are really good at, uh, reading this blog post or, or other testers' uh, um, content really helps. She has a, a couple of great uh, ideas in this uh, blog post that I'll share with you. One of them is think about, for whatever domain you're in, even really common entities that we all know, like we know what a name is, we know what a date or a time is. Date and times are hilarious. There are plenty of conference talks on just what can go wrong with dates and times. Uh, and of course the fun thing about going to the cloud is even if you're a company that operates in only one location, now you still get to deal with time zones, yay. Um, <laughs> so, for your domain, check what are falsehoods that developers believe about names, time, whatever you're working on. Uh, it will help you come up with some great test ideas. Um, if you want some interesting input to try on your application, there's the big list of naughty strings on GitHub that will give you some ideas of what to try. And another great source of inspiration is this uh, Twitter thread. A QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, orders zero beers, orders a gazillion beers, a lizard, minus one beer, a weird string. And uh, I, I put the link to both the thread and the blog post based on the thread that has like some of the best submissions because testers just pile on this thread, add all of their other weird input that helps break your application. Um, at a certain point, InfoSec finds the thread and starts SQL injecting the bar, and um, it's just funny, and, and it, it, but it does help give you the mindset of, okay, what are things to consider? What could go wrong? Because as a developer, usually I'm working on how do I make it do what it should do, and don't always consider thinking about what it shouldn't do. So once we decide what we want to test, we need to think about how are we going to test this? How are we going to interact with our application to find out that internally it does what it's supposed to do and it gives us the result that we want? Um, I've worked in mostly backend teams, so 
Uh, I've have been lucky enough to not have to go through a UI and wait for the UI to render and wait for the things to be there so that I could do my testing because that's annoying, right? Um, so, but, but think about that. If you do have a UI, do you need to go through the UI for all of those tests or is there an API that you can talk to to verify the, the internal workings of your application? Um, a model for this is the test pyramid. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw Ehar's talk yesterday, uh, which was also about testing. Ah, over here, okay. So he um, showed us the test pyramid uh, and the, the why of the test pyramid, which is just a model, but the idea is that unit tests are small and fast and therefore cheap to run. And the higher up in your integration you are, or the, the bigger the, the thing that you're testing, the part of your system that you're testing, the more expensive and slower your tests are. So the idea of the test pyramid is you want lots of unit tests, some integration tests, and very little testing through the UI or end-to-end -end tests because those tend to be expensive, flaky, etc. Of course, uh, Ihar showed us yesterday the honeycomb model, which said less unit testing, more integration testing, because that's where you know that it really works well together. Um, but my main point is I want my tests to be fast. I want them to give me the result as quickly as possible, because if I'm waiting for a build of 15 minutes, I'm off reading Twitter, to be honest. So <laughs> uh, I want that to be much faster so that I stay in my flow and, and can continue building my feature. Of course, unit tests, as fast as they are, don't tell us that everything plays well together. Um, there are lots of examples. This is a great one that uh, Sander happened to tweet as I was uh, writing this talk, so I am much obliged for this uh, perfect illustration. Um, and if we're talking about how are we going to test this, Thinking about that before we build the application will also help us build testability in, because we're thinking about how are we going to test this application? How are we going to interact with our application so that we can test it and can see that it works? Um, that's another thing that's really hard to add on at the end. Um, so think about that as you're building a new application or adding uh, stuff to your application. The next thing is use the right tools. They will make your life easier. And don't just choose the right tools, but use them as intended. Uh, I've been a contributor to Cucumber, which is a BDD tool. Um, and we often get questions like, can I do performance testing with Cucumber? Maybe, but I don't think you're gonna get the best out of it. Or if you use a tool not as intended, you're fighting against the tool, and then upgrading will become a problem because your use case is not considered. Um, so think about what tools do you select. There are tools for different purposes. If you're doing unit testing, uh, I'm used to using JUnit, but you can use TestNG. Uh, use uh, mocking frameworks if you need them. I like Mockito and Wiremock. Um, if you're talking to an API, you can use Postman or HTTP client, or you can use Rest Assured, which is a library to talk to an API that helps you also sort of fluently do your requests and, and process the, the response and, and assert things on the response. Uh, for BDD, there's Serenity or Cucumber. For contract testing, does everybody know what contract testing is? Would anybody like me to explain? Yay, okay, I get to tell people about something new. Uh, so contract testing is if you have multiple services, a consumer talks to a producer, uh, if I send a request, I expect a response. So if we're building these services, we can talk to each other beforehand and say, okay, if I do this request, I expect this result. We can put the result of that conversation in a contract, and then on the producer side, we can generate tests to check that we didn't break our API. And on the consumer side, we have a mock that we know is tested that we can use to test our side of things. 
Um, I've used Spring Cloud contract testing for that, but if you're not solely on the JVM, you can also use Pact, uh, which works with uh, different programming languages. Of course, test containers is great if you need databases or anything. Um, for performance testing, there are several different options. And if you need to go through the UI, there's uh, Cypress, which is JavaScript, or Selenium, which supports multiple languages, I think, that you can use to interact with your uh, front end. So like I said, use those tools as intended, so you're not fighting against the tool to try and get your stuff done. Um, and it will make the tool easier to use, it will make you get the best out of the tool, and it will make it easier to keep up to date with the tool. Like I said, the idea is that tests should increase confidence. Um, uh, Maike Brinkhoff, who's a Dutch tester, uh, tweeted this as I was writing the talk. So she says again, as a tester, your primary concern is to increase the confidence in what you're building. In order to do that, your tests need to be reliable. Um, who here hates flaky tests? Any hands that didn't go up? No, everybody, <laughs> right? So I tweeted this at some point. If it's flaky and you know it, fix your tests. Because I, there's nothing I hate more than a test that just randomly fails, and you don't know why, and at some point you're going to start just ignoring it, even if, it, if there is an actual failure. So I would rather not have that test at all than have it be flaky, um, which is also coincidentally what Benjamin thought. Like, if it's flaky, just kill it. <laughs> if you can't fix it, it's just going to add confusion. You want your tests to tell you, okay, we can release this to production, we can merge this, we can use this, it works as intended. Um, so if you have tests in place, this is another thing that breaks my heart, there are tests, <laughs> but we skip them. Why? That's like, I have a seatbelt, but I won't wear it. It makes no sense. Yes, but they take too long. Okay, that's the actual problem that you should be fixing. Can you make them faster? Can you, are you using integration tests for actual integration, or is that something that you could test in a unit test? Because if I don't have to restart a Spring context all the time, I would prefer to not do that, because that's much faster. Um, the next funny thing is tests that have been disabled. I was going to go back and forth between some code examples, but instead I'm just going to finish the slides and then go into my IDE, um, technically easier. So I found tests, literally, that have an at ignore on them for two years. This has happened to me not once, but twice. And worse, but I'll show you that later. Um, Never trust a test that you haven't seen fail. If you haven't seen it fail, you don't know that it will fail in the situation that you want it to. I see someone nodding. You probably <laughs> have encountered this. So, you know, we have a failing test. It should tell us something. And it should tell us exactly what is wrong, and it should tell us so quickly. Again, if the build takes 15 minutes, I'm off reading Twitter, I might be back at some point at some point, but it's going to take longer. Um, and uh, Kevin Henney liked my point so much, he quoted me uh, at GoTo conference, so achievement unlocked, woohoo. Um, also, each test should test one thing. If you have a test that tests multiple things in a row, if the first thing fails, you won't know if the other things still work or not. So it could be hiding even multiple failures. Um, use meaningful and descriptive names for your tests. I've encountered test classes that were like, test scenario one, test scenario two. Well, if that fails, that doesn't tell me anything. So, and, and, and be aware that we're writing the feature now, someone else, possibly you, might be writing a different feature months from now, and we won't remember what we did here. So, we, if that test fails, we want it to tell us quickly, hey, this is what was supposed to happen, 
And this is what actually happened. And then you can make an informed decision of, oh, I broke something because it should still do this. Or, hmm, I added a new feature, and that actually has impact on this feature, so I need to update the test to reflect the new situation. Um, and for that also, making your tests readable helps, because it helps you to understand that feature that someone else may have written, or you may have written multiple months ago, which is pretty much the same thing, because at that point, that was a whole other developer six months ago, right? Um, so it should help you understand, this is what it was supposed to do. And then you can think about, should it still be doing that, or do I need to change it? Also consider um, the costs of your test versus the value that they bring. So the cost of your test is not just writing them as you're writing the feature, which has value all of its own because it helps you think about the feature that you're writing, um, but also the cost of running those tests. Like I said, the 15-minute build, that takes too long. Uh, the cost of maintaining the, the tests. So if you're adding on your tests at the end and they're testing your implementation, you change your implementation, you have to change all of your tests, so make sure that your tests are testing the behavior and not the implementation. Um, and keep in mind that debugging failures is going to take the most time. That's why I'm saying it should tell you exactly what's wrong. Um, and it should help you quickly understand this is what's happening. And you shouldn't have to read a long te test to figure out, oh, this is what it's doing, yada, yada, yada. Because that's going to take you a lot of time analyzing those failures. Uh, so if they're no longer bringing you uh, value, delete those tests. You need to maintain your test code just as you do your production code. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean that you need to always adhere to the same principles. I, for one, don't think you need to be extremely dry in your tests. It's okay to repeat yourself if it helps you to understand what your application does. But do maintain your tests along with your production code um, so that they can bring you value, just like you would maintain your car and make sure that your brakes and your seat belts, et cetera, still work. Um, so, but for, please just test your code, however you do it, <laughs> but make sure that it brings you value. Um, so that was the slide part. Let me bring up my IDE. So like I said, um, you know, you work on a new project, you go into the test, uh, and you find a test that's been ignored for multiple years and may or may not still work. Um, don't do that. But that's still, if you, if you do ignore a test briefly, that's still better than this. I've also encountered like a complete test class. Oh, you can't see it. Shit, sorry. Um, it would all... Dang it. Uh, let me do the thingy. Now you can see it. So the attic door on the test still better than... I wish I hadn't seen this in an actual project. Um, and I hope you never will. But just for fun, when you get back to work, look, your, look through your tests to see if you can find any at ignored or any of this and, and delete them, please. Um, the most creative one I saw... <laughs> someone had commented out the at test. Do you want to guess how long ago it was? Four years ago. How about we just delete that? And um, an example that I got last time I did this talk was someone who said, yeah, or we just comment out the asserts. That works. Um, speaking of asserts, uh, I said your tests, you have to see your test fail to know that it works. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this one? IntelliJ can tell me. If I hover, the result, or that's really small, uh, it says the result of assert that is ignored. 
So assert that doesn't do anything by itself. You need to assert that it's equal to something. Um, now, IntelliJ can help you with that. Um, no, that's not what I want. Oh, sorry, can't, anyway, what we want is to have it is equal to something else. Now it will actually test something and it will also actually fail if I put a different uh, result in there. Um, I've seen tests without assertions, without any assertions at all, not even commented out assertions. This is what happens if you have test coverage as a goal, as a metric. You know, you end up writing tests. I see people nodding, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you end up testing the getters and setters of Java. I mean, it's been around for a while. I hope they work, right? So if you have test coverage as a metric, you end up with tests that don't really add a lot of value. Um, I'm not saying test coverage isn't useful at all. I think it's helpful to know where are we missing coverage and, is that, and, and we can have a look to see is this something that we should have tests for. Um, uh, this is an example. My husband's also a software developer. He brought me this example. If this fails, it doesn't tell me anything. Assert that it's true, it's gonna be false if it's different values, but it doesn't tell me what the value is and what the value uh, was supposed to be. So we can simplify that assertion. Now if it fails, it will tell us this is the value that we wanted, this is the value that we got, and that will help us figure out what's wrong and how to fix it more quickly than the other one. Personal pet peeve. The, the test says, you notice what I'm gonna say, thank you. It should return true, assert that it's false. Like really? Be more clear, which one is it? Um, so this was one that I encountered, use meaningful names. I actually tweeted about this at the time. I'm like, I found tests that were like, test one, test two, and two of my friends, unrelated, they don't know each other, were like, so are you sad one or sad two? So, yeah, just don't. Um, like I said, test one thing. If you're testing multiple things in a row, if the first thing fails, I don't know if the second and the third and whatever the next thing, if it still works. So this is three different tests, right? An empty list should be empty. If it has one thing, it should have one thing. If there's multiple, there's multiple. So split that out, because otherwise you might be hiding failures. Um, so that was all of my examples. Um, I'd be happy to add more examples if you have any. So please come find me or tweet me or uh, whatever. Um, I'm doing really well on time, so catching up for Mary. Um, are there any questions? Don't be afraid, I won't bite. Or are there any in the app? Yes, do you? Works. Hello, ah, okay. Uh, you say that you like to do a lot of unit testing, but sometimes you have a service that it's only connecting to Kafka. In this case, you will use unit testing and mock everything, or you will use integration with test containers or something like that? Um, well, that's a good question. If, if all it does is send messages, uh, that would be hard to unit test. Um, but I would still prefer, assuming that there is any business logic, you know, it might need to decide when to send something or what to send, uh, I might still try uh, unit testing that and seeing that methods get called with the right uh, messages. But yes, you would have to have integration tests to see that actually the messages are getting sent correctly. Um, so that's why also I said it depends on your context. Uh, it depends is the most used answer for all of the questions uh, for a reason. Uh, and often the, the thing that's 
most interesting in the answer is what does it depend on? So, yeah, without having further context of your <laughs> question, so it's hard to I'm answer. I'm thinking in a repository that the only thing that does is write to database. In this case, I think, in, I, I, in my opinion, I think unit test is not giving a lot yeah. of importance because you need to mock. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would use test containers to have the database that we're actually using and check that it um, does the right thing. Um, but still, if there was any logic in between, so I'm receiving a message and I need to extract things to save to the database, that logic, I would try to unit test. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, nice presentation. Thank uh, you. I have a question regarding contract testing. Uh, so, uh, what's your preference, uh, like, what's your go-to tool when it comes to contract testing, and why? Um, I really like the idea of contract testing, um, and as the, at least the Spring Cloud uh, contract testing documentation, uh, they're speaking more in a, in a TDD uh, or BDD way of, like, first discuss between the consumer and the producer what uh, you expect the integration to be and how, you know, if we have this request, this would be the response. Have a conversation and talk about what you expect and then put the result of that conversation into the contract. Um, so it, they really emphasize that you should be talking to each other and discussing what you expect. Um, and I think if you use it in that way, it can be really useful, especially if uh, different teams might be building the different sides. They might not be aligned in time. So you can start by discussing the contract and writing it down so that they can de um, develop independently of each other. Uh, but unfortunately, what I've seen happen is uh, people implement contract testing as a tool, as a technical solution, without actually talking to each other and discussing, okay, this is what should be in the contract, but it's like, I'll just write a file and commit it and, uh, and automate the problem away, but whereas what the problem really is uh, organizational, not technical. Um, and I've also been in a situation where they started with contract testing, um, and even though the, the documentation specifically states you should have one contract, uh, we ended up with, no lie, 206 contracts, which are all files, and if you're running your tests, all of those files need to load, which takes a long time. And we replaced that with um, programmatic mocks, so basically creating an object that we can then manipulate in the test to be any kind of object that we want for different scenarios, and to JSON that, and then um, work with that, and we shaved minutes off our build. So. That, that also goes to the use the tool as it is intended to get the most value of it, out of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what did you think is the best way to write a test in terms of nomenclature? For example, in the name, we can define a test name like, uh, uh, Execute to do something when I have anything, for example, let's say. And also, in inside of the test, there are frameworks that give you an example of how do you have to write your test. For example, Spark. Spark is a, a framework that gives you given when then. So, yes. we, so based on that, what do you think is the best way or a good nomenclature for those tests, for so write those tests? So your, your question is, what do, what do I think is a good format to write yes, the names of yes, the tests? Yes, to make it, uh, it well-formatted, uh, understandable, and things like that. Yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm a contributor to Cucumber, or I was, I'm not as active now, which also uses the given, when, then format. Um, I find the format helpful, but it's still a model um, for each test. I think it's important to think about you have a situation, a given, uh, or you, uh, in, in TDD terms it's arrange, act, and assert, which is 
pretty much the same thing. So you need to set up a known state. You perform an action, the when, and you expect the result, the then. Um, ideally, I would like my tests to describe that because that makes it easy to understand. This was the start, this is what we did, this is what we end up with. Uh, but also depending on how you structure your test suite altogether, you might have a file that all has the same starting situation. So then you, in the name you might only say when this happens we get this, when this happens we get this. Uh, within the context of that file that's still clear. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Um, I heard that you are a big fan from TDD. So I have a one question which actually my company become a big topic and it was the following. Um, well, when you are doing TDD, eventually you came up with your service and the service, the methods are public, yeah? So one day one developer started to make private methods. So he was not following this TDD idea, but then eventually he was like, okay, but I don't want to have my methods public, so how I do that by following the TDD? And this become a big discussion. So I, I, would, I would love to hear your opinion about this situation. Thank you. Yeah, so the discussion was, should we ma make all of the methods public so we can test them? Um, yeah, we love to argue about the same stuff over and over, don't we? Um, Tabs versus spaces, everyone. Um, yeah, so an important thing in TDD that is sometimes overlooked is there are three phases. Red, the failing test. Green, making it pass. And then refactor. And we forget about that. So we could make them public while we're writing the functionality and be able to do the red and the green. And then at some point, point if the, be the intended behavior and the implementation that goes with it becomes more clear, we can think about how do we encapsulate that and refactor the tests to reflect that. Is that helpful? Cool, thanks. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I'm the one that uh, commented out the test annotation some time ago. But that's why I'm here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Please don't do that again. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> it's a little bit related. Uh, I found sometime that uh, we do the code, we do the test in that order, and uh, then we find out that we better change some of the code to make the test easier or better. Mm. Is this a practice that should be forbidden at all? Like changing no. the code because for making the test easier or I, I don't feel good when doing that or when it <laughs> so the, this is another one of these discussions that we love to have like we shouldn't change our production code just for testing it depends <laughs> sorry so uh, it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's not forbidden okay. no well Sometimes you need to do things in order to be able to test that. I, I really do think that you should have testable code. It's just that you don't want to overexpose your code just to be able to test it, which re refers back to the earlier question, like should all the methods be public? Maybe no. We want to encapsulate it, but we still want to be able to reach that logic and be able to test it. Um, and I definitely believe we should uh, change our applications to make it easier to test without, of course, changing the functionality or overexposing things that we don't want to expose. Uh, I've also worked on teams where we had specific endpoints for end-to-end -end tests to set up state, um, so an admin endpoint where we could just insert data uh, to be able to, to do end-to-end -end tests. Those are not exposed on production but they, are, they do add uh, testability to our application. So there are no golden rules. I'm sorry. We have to think about this job. So it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Goedemiddag. Hey. I have uh, <laughs> one question about 
two different types of testing that haven't been mentioned so far yet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what is your view on load testing and penetration testing? How much of a priority is it for you in projects that you're working on? Um, yeah, I, I did have some uh, load testing uh, frameworks. Um, I think it's important, but it's not something I have a lot of experience with. Um, and in general, we tend to find them more through actual use and delays, and so it's the monitoring and observability part um, where we actually find the performance issues, unfortunately. Um, penetration testing, so also in Brian's talk, he mentioned um, DevSecOps, so security should be a part of the whole um, DevOps cycle, just like we said, we test here, we think about security also here, and here is everywhere. Um, especially in DevOps, when you release multiple times a day and you don't have the time to have like an ethical hacker uh, perform uh, pen tests. So there are lots of other things that you can do, like uh, code scanning and scanning for vulnerabilities that will hopefully help you not release that to production where the pen tester can find it. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, Brian's talk for that as well. Someone all the way over there as well. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. Great talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. My question is, um, you mentioned about the coverage being a really bad for gold, of course. Um, have you used something like mutation testing for actually check that those uh, tests that are really not asserting anything? And will you recommend it? I'm not sure. I, I've played with it. I haven't really used it on production uh, or, or on actual projects. Um, I think it can be useful because it's a way to catch your blind spots. Um, and I mean, why wouldn't you use that if it can help you? Um, but it still feels to me a little bit like the contract testing, like we have maybe more of a people problem of thinking, understanding what our application should do and understanding what it shouldn't do and what the risks are, and we are solving it with technology. So that would be my fear of using it. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question would be, how far would you go to uh, keep the structure of a test class um, if you have very deeply nested objects? Oh, God, those are annoying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would need more context. Maybe we can discuss that. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll come later. Yeah, I'll be around the rest of the day, so come find me if you want. Hi. Hi. Nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there were two things I wanted to address. Uh, well, first of all, I don't mean to hurt you, but I have 97 ignore tests. Uh, and I just kind of felt attacked about it. Uh, so I just wanted to. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, just wanted to justify myself and perhaps uh, share my perspective on this topic from an another point of view. Uh, sometimes. We use, I use this, we use this uh, as a measure to, to develop code, for, for instance, to access some other external resources outside the boundary. Uh, then we mark them, those external resources, and well, then we write perfect tests. Um, to access those external resources to cross the boundary, well, the easiest way to do that is to write a test. It's a tiny snippet of code, you just write a test, you run it and you have the response, so you can mock it. So that's one way to, oh, sorry. After writing the mocked test, we will no longer need that uh, boundary crossing. So just simply comment out the test for next time I, I will need it. Uh, the second thing, in two of your slides, you mentioned that a single unit test should be testing one thing and only one thing. I was always kind of scratching my head about that. Can you define one thing? 
What's, what's a unit? What's the one thing? Mm. That's another one of those yes. infinite discussions, isn't it? Um, so I didn't mean to attack you if you have no tests. I hope I'm giving you some ideas of how you might improve on that if you want, in your context, if you need to. Um, in my, the last team I was part of, we did have an application that was very, very small, didn't really do a lot, and there were no tests in the project. But still, if we deploy it, you know, check the logging to see that there are no errors, do maybe one small thing to know that the application is up. So it can be as simple as just a smoke test. If you deploy it, make sure that everything is still running and it's not erroring and things. Um, and what is a unit and what is a meaningful unit depends on the context, I, w I would say. Uh, but I have seen tests where, oh, while we're here, let's just check all of these things. Uh, where if you fail in the first check, then you're hiding potential failures in other checks. So it's more an idea of keep this in mind and make sure that you're not yeah, hiding stuff uh, and, and that you know if your test fails what the failure is, what still works and what doesn't. So it's, it's more to think about it. Sorry? It depends, yes. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm happy to talk about testing all day, but I think also it might be lunchtime. So, yeah, you <laughs> thank you.